Welcome to Back to the Frame Rate, part of the Western Media Podcast Network. Back to the Frame Rate, where we watch and discuss films on VOD and streaming platforms for your entertainment. I am your host, Nathan Shure, and I'm here with Ellie Escobar, Sam Cole, and Brianna Butterworth. Welcome back, everyone. <laughs> here we are. Hey, you know, we've reached episode number 30. That's impressive. That's some milestone. Yeah. Some form. Yeah. Very, I don't, there, are enough, there aren't enough Star Trek movies to reach this high, but there are enough Godzilla movies. That's true. Yeah. There's not even enough James Bond movies to get that high. Oh, we've exceeded that. We've gone through the if, roof. I don't know if there, how many, um, if there any other franchises that have gotten up to the 30th movie besides the Godzilla. I'm trying to think if there's any others. If I said Anyone the Furious, any? it's going to get there. In, no. time, in time, Fast and the Furious will get there. They'll be like, Whoa, Did you see my picture? I and I'll watch every single one of them. Did you see, did you see the picture <laughs> I posted on Facebook today? Yes. I did. That was ah. hilarious. Was it Fast, was it fast yeah. 39 yeah. or something? Or <laughs> <laughs> I, I did get a chuckle out of that. <laughs> well, it is November. It's a new month. And we have- Technically, whole... it's not really November yet. Hey, don't don't break the illusion, Ellie. It is it is November because I say it is. The world the world is listening to this in November, and we are beginning a brand new retrospective series, which uh, I'm really excited about. We are in November, and specifically, we are going to be looking at the film noir or neo noir films of the 1980s, and we're starting off with Paul Schrader's American Gigolo. And oh, I have just a, a trailer. <laughs> That's all. I, you know, Ellie, I've been humming that to myself all week. Me too. I help it. I just like, no. I'm just a gigolo. I'm cooking into the kitchen. La, 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 and everywhere I go. <laughs> all right. And uh, yeah, here's a clip from the trailer for American Gigolo. You know who I am. I know who you are. I know what you're thinking. You know what I'm thinking. You want to be here. You want to be with me. His name is Julian Kay. <laughs> what do you expect? His business is pleasure. Mm. Hello, Judy. Ah. Very sexy lady. Very good looking woman. Thank you. like me. He is the American Gigolo. Hello, girls. <laughs> you know, the trailer goes on and on. I had to cut it off because there's a, like a 30 second music interlude and then it keeps going. It's, it's, it's a, I love the trailer for this. But so that was a, a clip from that. And uh, this came out. I, you know, I was about to get into some of the details of this, but Sam, why don't you take it away for the movie facts? <laughs> Greetings, live from somewhere. It's the movie facts for American Gigolo. This film was released in 1980 and was directed by Paul Schrader. It was edited by Richard Halsey, who also co-edited Rocky Edward Scissorhands and Sister Act 1. Not to be confused with Sister Act 2, Back in the Habit, which, let's face it, was not as good. Uh, the music was by the father of disco, Giorgio Moroder. The Neverending Story, Scarface, and 1984, Metropolis, which he also did. This film was distributed by Paramount Pictures. It had a budget of $4,800,000 and did decently well worldwide. It grossed $22,743,674,000. This film stars Richard Gere as Julie K Julian Kay, Lauren Hutton as Michelle Stratton, Brian Davies as Charles Stratton, and Predator's own Bill Duke as Leon James. <laughs> Hector, El Hector Elizondo as Detective Sunday, Nina Van Pallant as Anne, and on a fascinating casting note, the role of Julian almost went to John Travolta, but he had to back out due to family obligations because his mother was sick. Secondly, and thank God this did not happen, it almost went to Chevy Chase. No disrespect, <laughs> Chevy. I'm glad it was not you. Christopher Reeve before landing with a much more appropriate Richard Gere. Um, 
That's uh, uh, Paul Schrader has some comments on the movie, but uh, let's just say that uh, both Siskel and Ebert gave it 3.5 stars separately, and Ebert called it a study in loneliness. Is it a study in loneliness? Find out from our review shortly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sam. You know what? I, the, did you guys, anyone else read, you know, Paul Schrader has never mm-hmm. held back some of, he's dropped a lot of truth bombs in his career. Mm -hmm. Um, there is, um, a lot circulating out there about the reason, his reasons why John Travolta left this project had nothing to do with family matters, but he said, I'm not here to spread rumors, but that the reason why is because John Travolta wasn't comfortable with his sexuality to, to be in this film. And that's the Mm -hmm. the real reason why he left this. I could see that. I mean, yeah, it's certainly the movie's kind of (laughs) aggressive with, Certain, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I could see that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and gear picked it up because of the homosexual undertones, which I thought yes. was weird and interesting. Um, but I thought John Travolta dropped out because it would be a disgusting choice for him. Terrible movie if oh. it were made with him. He, I actually disagree. I think Travolta could have been in this film and it would, he would have had a, I don't know if the, you know what? I don't know if his career would have been any different. I don't know. They have a very similar career path in a lot of ways i, th- I think Travolta, they're completely different actors yes oh yes they're they're different i think travolta could have pulled it off i'm so glad it wasn't uh chevy chase because i think he would have oh, made God. it like a creepy <laughs> comedy or something you know like yeah. chevy you- chase may have gone into more dramatic acting roles perhaps who knows i don't know this is all speculation but anyways you know what we didn't do this beforehand because we we were trying to do this is like uh, pick our order ahead of time, but let's just do this right now. We're going to go with Sam, Ellie, B, and then myself with our thoughts on this film. So Sam, why don't you jump in and tell us your thoughts on American Gigolo? Did you want to give a plot synopsis or would you like me to jump in? I would like to do a plot synopsis. <laughs> Thank you. I'm happy to jump. I'm all, I, I always <laughs> like to talk, but I'm just saying, you know. I will do a quick Plot synopsis of American Jiggle. This, here we go. Julian makes a lucrative living as an escort to older women in Los Angeles, in the Los Angeles area. He begins a relationship with Michelle, a local politician's wife, without expecting any pay. One of his clients is murdered, and Detective Sunday begins pumping him for details on his different clients, something he is reluctant to do considering the nature of his work. Julian begins to suspect he's being framed. Meanwhile, Michelle begins to fall in love with him. So that is a plot synopsis from somewhere on the internet. What's our source, B? I don't know. It doesn't matter. That sums it up. So, Sam, <laughs> let's get to your thoughts on American Chicago. So I would say, uh, and this is just my opinion, Paul Schrader has definitely done some interesting films. I respect him. I also like Affliction with Nick Nolte. I did not know he directed that film. I like it a lot. (laughs) For me personally, I did not particularly connect with this film, but I respect it. Um, I I liked, I appreciated his effort. I I thought the kind of noir world of Los Angeles was interesting. I especially liked seeing Los Angeles in 1980 when there's a lot more green trees around and less real estate and like less smog. That's nice. Um, for me, I would say that I enjoyed the second half a lot better. This film runs just less than two hours. Um, and the first half, though I respected what it was trying to do, I felt, strangely enough, as if I was watching actors uh, reading lines and doing a good job and trying to like make their performance is real. They were, and, and, and Richard Gere and, and everyone in the cast was good. I think for me, and this is why I say this re- respectfully, because it's not a full on negative review, though I personally didn't connect with the film. I respect what it was trying to do. My rating system uh, with the five star rating system, I would give it um, 2.5 out of five. And the extra half a star would definitely come from the second hour when the noose starts to tighten. Um, I felt more suspense when he was accused and framed for the murder. That kind of worked for me, and I felt and I felt kind of engaged. I I don't I don't I like um, slow paced films. I've never had a problem with that. Deliverance is one of my favorite movies, and that movie is certainly not like a rushed down the river. Um, I I just did not 
It's not the River Wild. That's for it's sure. Not, it's not the River Wild. Nothing is. That movie is incredible. But uh, I just <laughs> didn't connect, although I respect it. And I know that in the film noir genre, part of the point of movies is like that is you're not sure who a clear protagonist is or who an antagonist is. It's supposed to be murky. It's supposed to be Roger Ebert was saying the film is a study in loneliness. And I did feel that vibe. I liked the camera angles. I, I think the, the, some of the cinematography is amazing. I just felt a disconnect from the film. And I can't tell if that was me because I've only seen it once. That was just my reaction. I will say I like the buildup of suspense. I like the climax, the second hour, a lot better when it came more alive and there is nothing more entertaining to me than seeing Richard gear stressed out and trying to solve problems. He's made a career of that. I love it yeah. when, when he's in Mothman and he's confused out of his mind and he's like, what the hell is going on around here? And so it, it all, the movie like amped up in the second half, the first, the first hour was fine. I thought the characters were good, but I didn't feel a sense of direction and I just felt my attention start to drift. So I think my review is a little harsh. I could go up to three. This is just my experience from one viewing, having no history or connection to this movie um, in my life before, but I did love the soundtrack and I, mm -hmm. the atmosphere. Um, so that would just be my, my general summing soundtrack up. Soundtrack rips. Soundtrack's amazing. That'd be my general summing up without going into detail. And I did like Bill Duke a lot. Um, and since like we're, that. since we don't have to worry about spoilers or anything like that, I, him being like falling off the building, being semi thrown off by Richard Gere was a fascinating shocker to me. I was not yeah. expecting that. So s slightly lukewarm, but not a negative review, not a wildly positive review. That's, this is have me having seen the film once. Um, and that would be my sort of general assessment. Thank you, Sam. All right. Ellie. In fact, what are your yeah. Sam? I actually expected him to go off that that porch. That oh yeah, yeah. I when he was in that apartment, I'm thinking, okay, when are you gonna throw him off? Come on, throw him off the freaking porch! <laughs> oh my God. It terrifies me that you saw that coming. I totally saw it coming. I was like, all right. If oh my he, God. To me, it's like if you don't throw him out the window, I'm gonna be really mad because I'm already mad with the movie. Not mad, but I was just like bored. I was bored with the movie. That's the truth. It, it bored me because it dragged. And like Sam, I have to say, it didn't pick up for me until like the second, probably towards the end of the movie. Preferably when he threw him off the window. That's when it picked up for me. <laughs> That's where the switch happened. Yeah. But uh, before that, it, to me, really just need some carnage. Yeah, <laughs> I, I did. I did wish they'd show him like land on a car with like a dummy I mean, and like blood. And I was like, I yeah. actually, it, I thought it was a funny scene because I thought it was like it was. Um, he just got stuck with the two with the boots, and I'm like, oh my god, that's so funny. And the fact that I predicted it, and I was like, <laughs> I really wanted that to happen, and I'm so happy that it did happen. So, um, but other than that, like the first. For me, at the beginning, the whole movie was just a drag. It dragged. It was so slow. Mm -hmm. I, and I do enjoy slow movies, depending on the content. But the content of this movie didn't touch me, didn't touch my heart, didn't make me cry, didn't make me laugh. It just made me <laughs> bore. And then, uh, you, you know, you say, with all due respect. But anyway, respect to what? Because this movie is crap. I'm sorry. <laughs> but here's the thing. I like Richard Gere. Having said that, He's freaking hot, okay? And is that him naked for real, or is that his body double? Because by the window, um, that was a full shot of Richard Gere. Penis, dude. Um, I think one of the first times that there's male nudity, full frontal male nudity. Yeah. No, well, I wasn't looking at anything else, but you know, anyway. But so he's hot. <laughs> he's so handsome. I really love everything Gear does. I watch practically every movie he's made, except for this one. I never seen it before. Huh. I know why. But so even and, the and, sex and the guy game, and the guy can walk like nobody else. He can <laughs> walk <laughs> like I love his walk. He's so like I don't know that I can't even say uh, it's not that he's ha has elegance. He just has like this 
He's got swag. Swag. That's it. He's got mm-hmm. swag. And that, so I love the outfit that he's wearing when he has it on or off. And um, I like that. <laughs> I like his walk. I love the cars that he drives. Um, the he, black that, Mercedes 450 SL convertible. Careful, that was perfect movie car. Yeah. That's a yeah. great yeah. movie car. But he's always in movies, in cars like that. Have you noticed there's a lot of other films that he's in cars, like sporty looking cars, which is probably his mm-hmm. style. And but I I don't care for the soundtrack whatever anyway so yeah whatever so I'm uh, sorry okay but I'm just being honest here okay and and so there was a romantic element to this movie but there wasn't really and then the ending of the movie is like so lame it's like dude could you be more creative with the ending of this movie like made me feel bad for him being in jail but I don't feel it. I'm sorry. I just, I give it one star. Ellie, tell us how you really feel. <laughs> I'm worried that you're bottling things up. <laughs> That's That's a, Ellie, I know what you're saying. I feel like a lot of style in this movie, but I don't feel mm. content. Like when, when mm. there's emotion at the end, I was just kind of like. She mm. puts, the, you know, she like, puts yeah. her hand on the window and I'm like, okay. Like, couldn't you come up with a better ending? Like, no, so, yeah, yeah. it's a whole thing with the ending. I, no, it's not. It's not romantic. No, it's not about no, love. It's not about like. It's not. I've seen better it, movies than that. Not really. Okay, it's not really about love. It's 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 about it's it's about a lot of other things. I okay. You know, I'm not. I'm not going to go on. Go, go go ahead. Mind you, I I, I did not I, enjoy I, I, the I, sexual scenes. I didn't. I well, I thought surprisingly the, the porn the, in this movie. Scenes, well, I don't think so. Honestly, I think this movie has this reputation. Don't I, I don't mean to jump level. ahead of you, B, but I think this movie has a reputation of having these explicit sex scenes, but I thought they were very tame the way I remembered something. I've seen this movie before, years ago, and I remember something much more explicit than this movie actually shows. Yes, <laughs> yeah, false memories. Shot of gear by the window. By the way, the the budget it's for the great movie was five, five million dollars. Half mm-hmm. of that was was spent on Venetian blinds in this movie. I'm telling you. <laughs> I can see why. I can see why. I mean, they did great shots with those. Yeah. Like but, two really but, nice shots with but, those. But the, the point, but the, my point is that I don't think this movie was nearly as ex- explicit as I remember it being. Honestly, there there's so much more that I've seen in, in movies that aren't even considered. I think, like, look at like um, Basic Instinct. You know, yeah. fatal attraction. I think these movies, like Michael Douglas and and Billy Baldwin from the '90s, and all these movies, they're way, they go way further. That, than that's what I mean. It's soft porn. This movie is nowhere near as explicit as other things that started when, like, uh, erotic thrillers kind of made a. Big I'd say comeback. it's less soft porn and more like Dirty Magazine. You find like hiking one day. That you I would rather have that. something like steamy hot hardcore, hardcore than soft porn then i would have been interested but like it was like oh, i don't know man I'm backing up i want to i want to hear these thoughts okay <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah um oh, i'm so i love this movie <laughs> i'm sorry guys i love this movie i love paul schrader i think this movie is excellent at capturing male displacement and I think, I don't know, I mean, it's a visual medium. I think style is substance to a certain degree. So I think it's a freaking stylish movie. It established the Giorgio Armani brand, you know? Um, so you got you got points for that. It's got a supermodel and Lauren Hutton is the female lead. Everybody in this movie is hot. That's a good time. Um, but I also, I just think it does a really good job at creating this like, disconnect this there's this sort of um I can't really find the word for it but this like disconcerting feeling of like this person who doesn't quite blend with their background like there's discord that's happening between him and LA and you know it's someone who desperately wants to fit in and then he's sort of this outsider and where does he belong and um the only issue I really have with this movie is that I it feels so one-sided coming from Lauren. And I think it's supposed to for a while, but I think that goes on too long. I don't think we're invited into Richard Gere admitting his emotions for Lauren until a little bit too late. Um, But I think 
that part where he really starts to feel the tension and break down that uh, Sam, you were talking about is amazing. I think it kicks it into a whole nother gear, but I don't think you have that if you don't have the sort of like fish swimming in a, in the wrong size pond for a long enough time. I think you sort of need that first and that sort of cool, but off putting, like it's not cool swagger. It's cool, like cold, icy that you don't always feel that like hotel California vibe. I think this captures that really well. Um, I think the ending's great. He ripped off Bresson's pickpocketing. He openly admits to it. I think Schrader does best when he's mining from Bresson's over here. I think he did a great job. Uh, I think he ripped off pickpocketing in a couple movies. <laughs> I think it works. Um, yeah, I gave it a four out of five. I love it. Great. All right. Um, like I said earlier, I hadn't seen this movie in a while, and I'll admit that the first time I watched this, um, I, I don't think I was the biggest fan of this. I, I don't think I really understood what I was watching. I think I expected something else. But I think the greatest satisfaction that I can that no. I, I've taken away from this time watching this is that I'm, I, I watch this more as a mood piece than anything else now. Mm-hmm. I can almost picture Paul Schrader pitching this film to Paramount as a concept with no script at all. But what I think he did emphasize when he was going to the executives, he just said, stylish, sexy, provocative, and it's set in Los Angeles. That's all he had to pitch to them. And I think that's really what this movie is it encompasses down to. So so my thoughts. Um, I was surprised I up. How, how this film was structured. <laughs> We spend a lot of time with Julian in his day in the life, his job as a male escort, the meticulous decisions that he's making with his wardrobe, his Giorgio Armani suits are his, his battle armor, which I, I got a kick out of. He must choose his, 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 the, white, the right weaponry for each job every night. I got a kick out of this. Uh, it's a solid 40 minutes before it, there's any real threat or danger or the, the plot really kicks in. And I admit it, it, I was kind of looking at my watch a few times, like, where's this movie going? Um, but I, it, I didn't, it didn't bother me all that much, but I can see where there's a certain audience that is going to really get antsy with this film for the first half of this, at least the first 40, 45 minutes of this, because it, it is a lot of talking. It's a lot of people just, you're you're just seeing him go about really nothing's happening. I I get that. If this movie was redone today and there is, by the way, has anyone seen the, the, um, the, the series? I haven't seen it. I heard about it. I haven't seen it. Barenthal, um, the guy, the, the Punisher. I saw the trail. I am kind of curious, um, because I think it's a direct sequel to this. It's after Julian gets out of jail fifteen years later. So um, I am intrigued by this. So, anyways, um, I'm gonna move on here. It looks like B is having a few problems with her connection, but um. So anyways, okay, you can't, I'm going to pause for one second. All right. So I'm going to try to pick up where I left off here. Um, So anyways, this, um, again, what I still love about this, you know, it's LA, it's 1980. It's got the music scene. It's got the locations, you know, we're visiting, you know, these awesome places, you know, like the Sunset Plaza apartments, Rodeo Drive. The PCH Highway in Malibu, the, the Probe Nightclub, Beverly Hills Hotel, Tower Records in Westwood. I've been to so many of these places. I have not been to the Probe Nightclub, but so many of these places have been familiar. I lived in LA for three years, and even though it's 20 years after this movie was made, um, you know, it was it was very nostalgic seeing a lot of these places. And as you mentioned, Sam, yeah, it was yeah. Cool seeing a lot of the green in LA that's yeah. not there anymore. <laughs> but anyways, I'm digressing. But all of these elements, of course, the fashion creates this, I think, this beautiful cocktail that I, I found really enchanting and hypnotizing by this film. And I haven't even mentioned like the striking cinematography by John Bailey, who amazingly shoots uh, the Schrader's, I think, acid-lit vision of L.A., which I just loved so much. So in a nutshell, 
I really enjoyed this film. I think the second half, it kicks into gear. I didn't, was not bored at all watching this. I found it, yes, a little bit of a struggle at the beginning, but I think it lays groundwork. I was enjoyed getting to see uh, seeing a film where it takes the time to show us his his routine. And listen, I am a heterosexual straight man. I had no problem seeing Richard Gere strut around and, and walk around in those amazing <laughs> suits. It was, it was amazing seeing this. Yeah. So I had a great time. I give this, I'm giving this a four out of five stars. I And I think I could have given a higher rating if maybe it moved along a little bit better in the first half. So that is my um, quick review of American Gigolo. By the way, Sam, you mentioned before, I think, was it Roger Ebert or somebody said that this was a, a uh, something about a lonely man. Um, what was that? A study in loneliness. Well, study in loneliness. So this is actually part of a trilogy. Um, Paul Schrader's Lonely Man trilogy. Has anyone else seen the other movies, Light Sleeper and The Walker? That concludes the two movies in this trilogy. I have not seen those other films, no. So he's known for having like bookend movies and trilogy movies. So I'm just curious <laughs> if that something, if you anyone else wants to, uh, see those movies and did like American Gigolo that's listened to this. Those are two other movies in this, um, I guess it's sort of a trilogy uh, of films about the Lonely Man trilogy. So that's something to check out. Ellie's going to watch the next two of those films tonight, right, Ellie? Yeah, no, not, not, <laughs> happening. <laughs> not happening. <laughs> I think this is important. I have a question to ask uh, everyone here. So is Paul Schrader the originator of this vision of this world, you know, the style, the fashion, the cars, this whole outlook mm-hmm. on this LA scene, you know, because, or is he making a commentary on this world that already existed? Because we, I don't think I've seen a movie that has this look before. Uh, this case, this was filmed, I think, around 1979. It came out in 1980. But you know the prevalence of the Armani fashion, the luxury cars. I'm sh- I'm unsure if this existed in this manner prior to American Gigolo. And I think it's worth noting that not long after this movie's release, um, Armani suits became wildly popular, and even making their way to the likes of like Pat Riley, who's wearing them on the sidelines of Lakers games like a year later. So I'm just curious: did this movie have that big an influence on culture, or is he? commentating on something that's already happening mm. in the scene. Do you mean fashion culture? Not it's not just the fashion. I feel like it's the music. It is the it's the music, the the style, the 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 cars, it's it's the club life. I'm just curious. I I, mean, I think it's it's a whole cocktail of all of these things. I feel like kind of it this is ushering in the 80s right here right now. Yeah. I think that's why this movie is such a moment in time. It's such an important film. It's possible. I mean, I don't know him as, as well as, as a director. So, I mean, it's possible he ushered it in or it's possible it was happening in the time and he like tapped into what was going on. And that's what I can't really tell. Although I did like how the movie looked like I liked, I did feel the 1980 vibe mm-hmm. strongly, you know, I think it kind of, it's probably a little bit of both, but, um, I think there's a lot of like counterculture and gay subtext that's coming out. Like, I think he maybe is putting that more into the mainstream, but just even thinking about like even Warhol movies and stuff like that. And the focus on physique, I think that stuff is, is reminiscent of like even the late sixties. But then I think of, you know, Brian De Palme, even to a certain extent later in the eighties doing some of this kind of stuff. So I don't know. Yeah. It's a good question. Um, it just it, it didn't have that much success when it first came out, so I have a hard time imagining it as or it it didn't have that much financial success when it first came out, so I have a hard time imagining it as like a an iconoclast for the culture. When I think of like early '80s style financial success, more I think of like Scarface and people just like you know, even though it wasn't like well reviewed, but it's it's like got that '80s mm-hmm. vibe amped. Kind of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. De I, I want yeah. to talk about the the ending of this film because I think we have some <sighs> different views on this. And 
sounds like B, you're a huge fan. I don't know, Sam, were you <laughs> not? I know Ellie, you were not, but I am I'm unsure how I feel about the mm-hmm. ending of this. I want to hear, it's, I want to hear what you guys think. I think it's I didn't think it was bad per se. I just did not feel like I didn't feel much connection emotional engagement in this movie, even in the second half, and it, it, those, there was an improvement. So I thought the ending was fine, but but part of me was thinking, why isn't Richard Gere like pleading to the cops more and showing that he was framed once he found out? He, he seems to kind of like give up. And because he's, like, he's oh. so cool. <laughs> yeah, he's like after he like throws him out the window, he's like, "Oh man, I'm screwed." And he just kind of like, "Nobody talk to me, leave me alone. I'm terrible." And I'm like, "No, man, like I would be like fighting for my case." That so I, I thought it was fine, but I would have liked to have seen him like get out of jail and like escape with her and like have them go somewhere aside from just there like you go. Does he go you know, to jail hey. for the murder of Leon or is he just in jail for the frame job? I think he's in jail job. for the, the frame, frame job. job. Yeah, hmm. because the cop, the the person, that guy told him, "You're not, you're not, you're not even gonna be charged for Leon. It's death." But okay. For me, this is me watching the movie and the ending of the movie. What? <laughs> <laughs> That's the end. What the hell? That is the end. No, I wanted them to finish it differently. Like Sam said, it. I wanted him. I thought. I thought she came to visit him. She puts, you know, like she puts the hand on the window and he was going to like, first I thought he was going to put his hand next to her on top of her through the window. Well, whatever on the window. And then I thought, okay, maybe they're just going to like walk out together and you know, whatever. I know it's a reference to the Luke Besson film, but it also has a very biblical connotation too. That movie. Mm -hmm. What movie were you watching? Because that's not what I was watching. That's what I felt. Biblical. Okay, I want to hear what you mean by that. I just think it did. He's, he's like, he's... How? I, I just felt that. Okay. Yeah. Um. He actually talks about it in a biblical sense. He says that it was a grace note as unwarranted as Christ promised to the thief on the cross. Wait, what? Who said that? The, the Paul Schrader. He said uh, he lifted the ending of pickpocket and gave it to Julian Kay, a grace note as unwarranted as Christ's promise to the thief on the cross, which I think is really in line with Schrader's view of this like, nah, I didn't get that holier than thou male archetype and the redemption that he's getting at the end of this movie. It feels redemptive. Yeah. Nah. She so, had mentioned she was going to Rome. I thought they were going to get like on a plane or something like yeah, that. Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> that's what I'm, waiting for. <laughs> I'm waiting for that moment. Like, oh hell yeah! Like you, that would have even been a little bit more like yeah, yes, he's not going anywhere. So I, my, I just have <laughs> a couple of simple things about the ending. I, I think that this ending is very sloppy. Actually, um, <laughs> Michelle's visiting him in jail. And they have this scene where she's visiting. Oh yeah, she visits him, and then it goes to this another interrogation scene. And it weird. fades out between them. It fades. fades. And I was like, out. what? Yeah. And then they're weird. with another interrogation, another scene where they're together. And that's the final scene. I I believe this part of the film could have been a lot more concise, especially considering we're approaching this very quiet and emotionally charged moment at the end. The, ex- the extended ending, it felt like it has like three endings or something. Mm. I don't know. And it's leading. It could the- have just shifted up her interrogation and then just had the yeah. time that they're together. It's yeah. leading me to question whether Schrader had a well-defined vision for this conclusion, particularly with those, those fade outs, which weren't present anywhere else in this movie. It made me think that this was ending was really haphazardly re-edited or he didn't really know what he had or how to put it together. That's what but, I felt. I felt that kind of um, like it didn't quite land. And like, I'm, I'm half joking here, but like when, when it, when he put the hand up at the window, I, I half expected the curb your enthusiasm music was like, dude, and you're like, it's over. Dude. That's what it felt like. And I was like, what? Well, yeah, even give me, to- or at least give me some romantic song that goes with the window fan, but, Nothing. It's just like it just kind blup. of end. I, I, I yeah. Blup. It, 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 I like. I liked it. I don't think it was like perfectly executed, but I liked it. I thought it kind of humanized him, and the whole thing was her being like, "Oh, you just like you go to work. You go to work when you're with me." And then he was seen as like a three dimensional person. 
And then Blondie played, and I was happy enough. <laughs> what do you people want? I love Blondie, <laughs> and I love movie. I, I love I Blondie, love and I love the song. This movie didn't have anything for me. So. <laughs> Car- Carlos came down, and she's like, "What's the matter, mom?" She saw my face. He goes, "What's the matter, mom?" I'm dying, Carlos. I'm dying watching this stupid movie. No, I'm just kidding. I just oh my God. This movie is just not Carlos. It's, it's, I don't know. I'd, I'd take The Exorcist 2 over this movie. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that's, what do you think, that's what, what do you think about his uh, uh, the yellow gremlin that he has to drive? <laughs> he has to get rid of his Mercedes and drive the yellow gremlin. The cars that's were cool. cast incredibly well in this film. Like I've been telling yeah. you, we need to go back to back where the cars were colorful on the street because less mm-hmm. accidents. The cars now are all gray and gloomy. Oh, I, I, Totally agree. You don't even see them coming at you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't think that's the reason for the accidents, but yeah, I agree. More yeah, you're probably right. But Same. it, it <laughs> might help. <laughs> we're, we're, yeah, more coloring cars. I, I don't. I don't know if you want to give this information away to the world, but where are you right now? Me? Oh, I'm in uh, Whistler, British Columbia. Oh, okay. uh, I know you're near LA. Yeah, but how? Not I near mean, LA. <laughs> no. I, this I so badly want to drive the PCH. Again. Oh, I love the PCH. Yeah. I, 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 what's interesting to me about this movie is, is cause I, I mean, I, I live in LA now and like d- the LA itself does not particularly in, not in a bad way, does not particularly exude its own atmosphere. It's like this big open blank that directors put their own impression on. Mm-hmm. So it's interesting seeing Paul Schrader of it, but it's very pleasant. I mean, I love the PCH um, the PCH it doesn't exist anymore though. I mean, it was like this. It doesn't exist. No it's means, way. It's it's so built up now. You can't just like drive like that on the PCH anymore. It's you can't. I mean, it's there's it's still like there's still beautiful like hills and like vistas and coming around turns, but it's a lot more congested than that. But oh, I mean, yeah. there is there are parts of LA that are beautiful and and like I don't mean that. What I'm saying is I don't mean that LA doesn't exude its own atmosphere it's kind of like to me new york always feels a very specific way and so every time you see new york in a film in new york city manhattan directors can put variations on it but it's always there's an underpinning of aha we're looking at new york la there's something about it where people can invent their own vision of it and each vision is Mm. different i really like michael mann's heat a lot because i like the way Mm. la looks in that movie yeah can i just say something Go for it. <laughs> yeah. Every day at work, my survival job, we talk in acronyms. I am horrible with acronyms. I don't know what they stand for. I always have to ask, what the heck does A, B, C, D mean? And when you say you know PCH, yeah, okay. I'm breaking my head and I'm thinking like, why do acronyms follow me? So I had to actually Google it and say, <laughs> what is PCH? And it's Pacific Coast Highway. It is. Yes. And by the way, Ellie, you would totally love TOTK. Oh, what a great video game. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Tears of the Kingdom, Legend of Zelda plug-in. Available on Nintendo Switch now. It's amazing. I'm just going to switch. He those from the... I thought you guys were talking about a card at first. That makes no, sense. I can totally hear this. Some acronyms really throw me off, too. Like, <laughs> just listen to any financial, like, you know... Um, like radio station, like, oh, the CPK and the KK, blah, 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 and the THC. Blah, blah. And I'm like, so what you're saying is the company <laughs> lost money. <laughs> I feel like people that speak yeah. with the acronyms is just, that's just the lazy way of speaking. Yeah, but if we start calling it the Pacific Coast Highway, we lose all credibility. Why? Yeah. We just do. We can't talk about the Because, because, because it's the PCH, bro. It's the PCH. <laughs> 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 It's just what it is. <laughs> Fine. It's like calling it the Mass Pike. We, we wouldn't call it the Massachusetts Turnpike. Well, I do. As Uma Thurman said in uh, Pulp Fiction, don't be a... Square? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's a movie where John Travolta works. Yeah, but that was a really freaking cool movie, though. <laughs> it's a great movie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Big Pulp Fiction fan. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I love Pulp Fiction. Yeah, well, yeah, who doesn't? Yeah. yeah. This was, I think, a great conversation about American Gigolo. Um, I am curious what <laughs> See I said. what you I, did, Nathan. I See what you did. To, I love that we had different opinions on this. We were 
all of us were all over the map on this, and I think that makes a great conversation. But what even will make this even greater is when we get to this. Something in this field could be releasing the chemical into the air when there's too many of us together. Don't eyeball me, boy. I see your mother driving up and down the street looking at me. I'd be your stepfather by the week. It's a bad time, Bob. I'm serious. If I leave now, I'm not coming back. Give it here the expression. You got a phase only a mother can love. Let's just stay ahead of the wind. That is our bumper for our newly retitled wall casting, where we recast a character <laughs> from this film with Mark Wahlberg. And I'm really curious what everyone's picks are for this movie. <laughs> There's only uh, one pick. There's, there's only, only one, one pick. pick. Yeah. Right. Who wants to? Well, I, I don't want to keep asking it, but Sam, I want you to go first. Who do you? I first? I think he would make a great. Uh, is it Detective Sunday? Is that his name? Yeah, mm-hmm. that's Dick I, I think he would make a great. He'd be like, yeah. He'd be like, how can you deny this? Your fingerprints are at the scene. You don't have an alibi. I saw you there. I know you're guilty. Are we really playing games here, <laughs> Julian? How much more time is this going to take? You're guilty. <laughs> um, I guess just like I could see him delivering the lines. So, there's one line when Julian is like, "Hey, uh, so uh, Mr. Sunday," he's like, "No, that's Detective Sunday to you, screwball." <laughs> <laughs> so, I, yeah, I would put Mark Wahlberg as a detective. I couldn't put him as as Richard Gere's character because no, no it doesn't fit at all. Like it just doesn't. No fit. Yeah. Um, it would be yeah. the wrong vibe completely. <laughs> That's so Detective Sunday has got my vote for sure. <laughs> I, I'm gonna jump ahead and say I agree completely. That's my pick as well. <laughs> yeah. He just he could do that one, yeah. <laughs> it breaks my heart because you know, I love Hector Elizondo. I think he, in, in most things. I think he's a great actor. He's a great I, actor, I, yeah. Every time he It's he okay, they up, get back together in Pretty Woman. It's fine. He, they work together in a bunch of they work also in uh Runaway was it what's the other one? Runaway Bride? Another yeah. one with your gear. It, yeah. he, they, they work together all the time. Yeah, they're like bros. <laughs> Anyone else? Ellie, what about you? I uh, just I plug in Leon in Mark. I plug Mark Wahlberg as Leon. Nice. Yeah. All just, right. Because I can see him screaming huh. going down the. <laughs> He's whining. <laughs> I, I think they put, I, I think I think Johnny Carson in 1980 should have played Richard Gears kid. He'd be like, oh, so, I feel like. So. <laughs> Slightly aroused here. This is uh, this is wild. Oh, I'm going to take off my my shirt. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely a fan the of the lady. So. I want to hear the scene where he seduces the woman that's like coked up in bed. You know. Oh my god! <laughs> Isn't she the one that got murdered? Yeah. 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 From that's the scene from the trailer too. Yeah. So. Well, who killed her anyway? Oh, that that other guy, the guy that that uh, the other one that was Bill Duke's, uh, you know, Bill Duke's other uh, pimp did it, and then Bill yeah. Duke framed uh, oh, the blondie. Yeah, blondie. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. See, that's yeah. how much I was into the movie. <laughs> B, did you have a pick for recasting or or something else? Or something? I first choice definitely Detective Sunday. I thought there's that one scene where I was like, it might be interesting to put him as. The um the politician Charles Stratton because mm. they have that one scene in the courtyard and he has that great line where he's like you get on by the good graces of the people around you you're a hanger honor and I just think that would be kind of fun yeah That'd be a good one but Detective Sunday's the pick I mean that's what you have to do yep all right excellent so I think we already did our ratings for this but. The last thing I want to get to before we close the book on this is I want I would love for each of us to submit our MVP of this movie, whether it's a scene, an actor, somebody that worked on this. <laughs> I think I know what Ellie wants. Ellie, you're, you're jumping at this. It could be any element of this movie. It could it could be the Venetian blinds, which I considered, but whatever it is. Submit one thing that is the MVP of this movie. Uh, Sam. Uh, so I would, I actually liked Bill Duke a lot. Um, I, I And I haven't mm. seen him in a lot of other films. I've, I just, he's so like, I so associate him with Predator. And so it was fascinating mm. to see him in this movie. And I honestly did not suspect him at all until like there were shots of him getting in the car with a politician towards the end. And when 
his scene at the end when he's like, you're frameable and he was like ice cold. I was impressed by his performance. So I did, I, I, mm. I did like him. I mean, I, I was Bill Duke like added to the movie for me for sure. Yeah. All right. Such a good job. Ellie, dare I ask? <laughs> my favorite, MV, my MVP scene, you guys already know, is that one where, you know, he's like going down and he's like, <laughs> okay, it's just watching gear with them two boots on his hands, like, <laughs> <laughs> struggling to hold on to him. And he's not going, he's like, and then, what, what I did not, I, I expected him to go over it. What I didn't expect is those boots. <laughs> we're hanging off it was a little unintentionally comical when he's like don't fall he's like he's just so fall but I'm like you're the one that pushed him what did you think was going to happen you know like <laughs> and, then, and then I thought I mean, I mean it's one thing if he fell and he still had the boots on yeah. but he left the boots behind and so oh that takes the MVP for me <laughs> B what's your MVP soundtrack mm. Excellent. Soundtrack. Great soundtrack. My MVP, I'm giving to the entire opening driving sequence with Richard Gere driving down the PCH, setting the mood mm-hmm. for this. I love it, which includes the Blondie's Call Me song and just him driving in that black Mercedes. Um, I love that yeah, so much. I guess because uh, you think that's you and that Mercedes driving the MPCH. <laughs> whatever you want to say. MPCH. What's that phrase like? Women want him and, and men want to be him. That It's that whole thing, you know? <laughs> you know, you know so, I yeah. that. I somehow picture you just doing this to your hair, you know? You know? But you know, at the same time, I can say that, but you know what? These are these are emotionally and intellectually vapid people, <laughs> you know, these are not <laughs> smart people. <laughs> so I don't really, really, I'm not really jealous of anybody, including Richard Gere in this movie. This guy doesn't really know what's going on in the world. I don't think he is really, he's not an educated man. So I, he's, yes, he's street smart, but I don't, I'm not jealous of him really. <laughs> no. Let me no, tell I you, I think Richard Gere yeah. takes ballet dancing classes. Yeah. That's why he walks the way he does. Yeah. And he knows six languages. You know, yeah, he's got some things going for him. But, you know, those those <laughs> works are not going to take, you know, Richard Gere is still a good looking man at 74. So I, I shouldn't yes, say those works are not going to take him too far. They did take him far. So never mind. <laughs> so is Sam oh. Elliott. Sam Elliott is hot. Sam Elliott? Yes. I find him extremely How- sexy. So when you think Richard Gere, you think Sam Elliott? I I'll take I'll take Sam Elliott four okay. and gear all three. I still think I still think Johnny Carson in the main role he'd be like oh I would have charged five thousand but oh twenty five hundred for you sweetheart. Johnny Carson's oh not God. hot though. I know that's why I'm I'm going doing he the antithesis of, of what it, yeah. You know he reminds me of Bush. <laughs> he does the young Bush the the president Bush. Oh wait there was two okay. Bushes that were president not the dad the son. The son. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for this conversation. <laughs> As we transition to our next segment, I just want to express our gratitude for tuning into our show. Your feedback on our discussion of American Gigolo means a lot to us. You can connect with us on Facebook and Instagram by searching for Back to the Frame Rate or email us at backtotheframerate at gmail.com. Your support is greatly appreciated. In If you have a moment, please consider leaving a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your preferred podcast platform. Thank you sincerely for your support. Oh, in addition, we're excited to announce the release of our newsletter, Frame Rate Monthly. Uh, By the time this episode drops, our second episode or edition or newsletter uh, will have uh, dropped already. Uh, The newsletter is packed with details about our podcast, including what we're currently watching, upcoming discussion topics, interactive polls, and other engaging content. To subscribe uh, to the newsletter, simply send an email to us at backtotheframerate at gmail.com and and be sure to include newsletter in the subject line. And speaking of the newsletter, I think I want to do this. If you are a subscriber or you know, 
something that I think would entice people to subscribe is we have a poll in the, the newsletter. And I would love everyone that's listening to participate in it. And since we're in November, the poll question is, what is your favorite decade of film noir movies? And it's either 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, or 1990s. I know that's a lot of options, but if you go to the go to the poll question, I will have a link in the show notes. You can go to our poll and pick what your favorite decade of film noir movies are. Film noir slash neo noir. And uh, there's um, a lot of options for each of those that you that you can select from. So it's just uh, whatever decade is your favorite decade of, of film noir. So. Yeah, and I think that's going to be a poll that's going the entire month of November. And for the last episode of November, we will announce what the uh, winning decade was. So yeah, let's get some. Uh, let's get a bunch of people uh, to participate in that, and I'd love to see what everyone picks as the favorite decade. So yeah, there we go. Let's move on to our recommendation shelf. Sir. What? Are either one of these any good? I don't watch movies. <laughs> well, have you heard anything about either one of them? I find it's best to stay out of other people's affairs. You mean you haven't heard anybody say anything about either one of these? Nope. Well, what about these two? Oh, well, they suck. All right. It is time for a recommendation shelf where we recommend a film that uh, we love. And this week we are recommending underrated Richard Gere films. It's a pretty cool tie into this week's review. And uh, yeah, this should be a lot of fun. Is everyone ready for this? Woo! Ready. All right. Sam, since you are going first for everything <laughs> this week, let's begin with you. Number one, Ferrari. Anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's this is uh, channeling my uh, Adam Driver there, but um, I can't wait for Ferrari. Yeah. It's gonna be awesome. It's gonna yeah. be so I hope good. It's good. I, I don't know. We'll see. But uh, so I, um, this movie was actually uh, critically well received. I'm putting it in underrated Richard Gere film uh, because I don't know if a lot of people have seen it. And I love, love, love this movie. It's called Arbitrage. Came out in 2012. I haven't seen it. Yeah. Uh, directed by Nicholas Jarecki. And um, it, it budget of $12 million, box office $35 million, And uh, I, the cast is amazing. It's Richard Gere, Richard Gere Susan Sarandon, um, Nate Parker, Tim Roth, um, Britt Marling and many, many more. I love this movie. I think it's amazing. Um, it has, it's, it's really unfair to compare it to American Gigolo because they're two different beasts. For me personally, I find it incredibly suspenseful, emotionally engaging. Um, I will, without giving things away, because there's a, a, something that happens at the beginning that I really think should be a surprise if you haven't seen it. Richard Gere is a billionaire, successful New York businessman, flies all around the world, gets into trouble early on in the film, and Tim Roth is the detective that comes after him. I feel an emotional connection to this movie. It's suspenseful. It's amazing. The dialogue, the writing, the acting. I would put this in my top 20 favorite films. Um, if you guys get the chance to see it, I, uh, I really don't want to give too much away because it's recent enough that if anyone's interested and haven't seen it, it's not it's not film noir, but it's definitely a thriller detective story, um, and it is unconventional. It plays with tropes. It does not play out typically, and Richard Gere's performance is excellent in it. I've seen this movie several times, um, and I think, uh, just speaking for the three of you, obviously I had no idea what your reaction would, would be, but my guess is is it be towards the po positive Ellie? I think for some reason that you would specifically like this movie a lot. Um, I, I just, it's, I, I absolutely love it. That's my recommendation. I don't want to say too much about it, but if you guys haven't seen it. Check out 2012's arbitrage, Richard Gere, uh, excellent drama, suspenseful, an amazing performance by 
Tim Roth, who is always mm. upset that billionaires that he tries to convict are always getting away with crimes over and over. He's like, I'm sick of it, and I want to convict these people. And it's just, it's great. That's all I'll say. I could not, a glowing five out of five stars for me on that one. Yay. Great. This has been on my radar for uh, like 10 years. I have, mm. have never just gotten around to it, though. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Also, I love a Tim Roth shout out. I feel like we're just yeah. Pulp Fiction adjacent mm. today. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I will <laughs> say really quick, it's really nice to see a really, especially in modern times, a dramatic movie with great production design that was only $12 million to make. And I know that's like no small chunk of change, but in modern times for a movie to cost $12 million and look like that and have that whole New York backdrop is like hopeful to me because there's we've seen too many movies in 2023 that have like $300 million budgets and they don't look that great. So it's a, it's a win-win. <laughs> well, thank you, yeah, Sam. 2012. Oh, yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, Ellie, tell us about your recommendation. So for me, it's this has nothing to do with, how do you say, noir films? Film, yeah, we're not doing film noir. noir. It's underrated Richard Gere performances or films i do like to see richard in other movies other than you know being the gigolo so um i <laughs> recently actually watched this film a uh, hatch it's called hatchy i think oh you know? the dog yeah, yeah this, this was shot locally <laughs> yeah was it this was yeah lo- shot locally yeah in you providence lo- in rhode yeah. island oh nice yeah, yeah so so I several reasons why I love this movie and I recommend it. If you love dogs, watch this film. It's gonna make you cry. It's gonna make you at the beginning of the movie. It's gonna make you really happy, but then it's gonna make you really sad and cry, which it did for me. And it's just so amazing. This is based on a true story that happened in Japan in the 1930s. And um, he, this dog, it's um, what is what is what's the kind of dog? How do you no. Know? A husky? Is it a husky? No, no, like a Sheba? Like a Sheba? No, it's a, a, a Taki. I can't think. Hold on. What do they call them? Um, a, uh, I had it's it. It's not a Sheba Inu? The dog is a... Akita? A, Akita. It's an Akita mm-hmm. dog. And sometimes I think of my own dog as maybe mm-hmm. it's got a little bit of Akita in her. Um, Your dog but, is so cute. Thank you. Yeah, she's half chow mm-hmm. chow and half husky. And she's like the most devoted. So you know, dogs are devoted to your to you. Do you guys have dogs? I won't even ask if you have dogs. I, used I grew to, up with yeah. dogs. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I have a cocker okay. spaniel. So, so you know, they're like unconditional <laughs> love, devoted to you, and like they'll take a bullet for you, right? Well, this story of this dog is, and I'm very briefly going to say it, it's just uh, so touching. It's got so much heart, and um, basically, this dog becomes, um, I guess, follows gear richer to his house one day because he got lost um, in a train station and basically ends up with Richard Gere. And every time Richard goes to work, it, the dog comes with him, waits for him at the train station till he comes back then after work, you know, like nine to five, it's, it's there waiting. They walk together back home to one day. He doesn't come back because he had like a heart attack, I think. And then he died. And then the poor dog is waiting and waiting and, Supposedly, this dog waited for that owner for 10 years in the same spot every mm. day. That's My so heart broke. Sad. And, and, but there's a good side to this where you see all the other people around the train station become friends with the dog, you know, so because he was there all the time. And even the hot stand guys selling hot dogs gives like hot dogs to the dog while he waits for Richard to come back and. Like he doesn't get it. Like he's not coming back. And the wife of the uh, Richard's uh, wife in the movie, she moves and leaves him behind. Like nothing. Like oh man, that's so cruel. Um, but the fact that this is a true story is even more touching for me. I love it. If you love dogs, watch it. It's gonna just one day when you're you know, like on a weekend, rainy day. Get your Kleenex, get your popcorn, and watch. Right. I bet it. I bet it's better than Snow Dogs with Cuba Gooding Jr. <laughs> does yeah. I need to ask you, Ellie? Don't answer this, but does this movie come with any trigger warnings with dogs? Like, do I need to to 
Don't answer this question. Do I need to direct people to the website does the dog die.com? Because there are the a lot dog of die.com. Why yes. would you just do <laughs> all dogs die and go to heaven, but eventually there yeah. are like another free, good job movie. I don't want you to answer this question because I don't want you to spoil the movie, but there is an important website out there for people that are very sensitive about this called does the dog die.com where anybody who's listening that is interested in this movie mm-hmm. can go to that website and plug in uh, a title for a movie that includes a dog and they can see ahead of time if the dog is okay at the end of the movie. I have to do this for every movie that my daughter watches that has a dog in it now. Mm-hmm. So I'm just letting people know if they're curious for this movie. And this is a, this is a real thing. There's like dogs and movies is a yeah. real trigger for people. So I'm just I'm just letting people I'm just letting anyone know that. This Not is a that website. I recall. I think it's just basically he gets old. Okay. But anyway, you don't have to spoil it, but I'm just letting the audience know that this is a website that you can check out. Never knew so, about that website. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't just cover dogs; it'll cover yeah. other things too. Right? It's called Does the Dog Die dot But you get the snakes, decapitation, farting, <laughs> choking, sure. anti-Semitism. Uh, a lot of things you can you can see all sorts of triggers. triggers. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I did see a squirrel get run over once, and and it was kind of funny. But anyway, <laughs> all right. So oh, Sam. By the way, and I and I and I keep wanting to do this before we get too far away through our through our recommendations. Sam, where is arbitrage? I think that's oh, that's on Tubi in Pluto, and you can also rent it on VOD, and. Um, I was just looking here that Hachi is, I think you, you put prime, but I think it's only available on video on demand for rental or purchase as, as far as I can see. Yeah. Oh, uh, streaming agent. Uh, oh, well, I think streaming, it's streaming agencies. Yeah. It's not streaming anywhere, but it's available for purchase or rent. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. B, what is your recommendation this week? Sure. Uh, I chose Breathless, the 1983 reimagining of Godard's movie. Um, Of course, the 60s French classic. Um, It's just kind of a fun, wacky performance from Richard Gere. I think you get to see a different side to him. I think he plays it intentionally weird. I think he runs um, just, I don't know, it's just kind of a funky performance from him, but I think it works. I think it works with the sort of zaniness of the movie. Um, yeah, I, it's just fun. It's just something fun and different to check out if you want to see a totally different side to his uh, portfolio of stuff. So check it out and, you know, do it a double feature. <laughs> I debated Breathless as my recommendation because it's, it, I actually like this movie probably more than I should because I think it's the first, my first exposure can I say it? first exposure to Richard Gere was breathless? I mean, <laughs> I thought Jacob was your first one. Jacob was our first exposure. Yeah. No, <laughs> I saw Breathless probably at a way too young age, way too young of an mm-hmm. age, back in probably the early mid eighties or so. I don't know what I was probably watching. Is it Natasha Kinski? I think so. Yes, I think that. I think that, so. That brought me into adulthood. Probably Natasha Kinsley. I don't know, but <laughs> yeah, but yeah, that was, uh, it's that was a experience. fun movie. You it know, like they, yeah, I just think it's cool performances. It's a fun reimagining. Um, yeah. It's got a totally different feeling than Godard's movie. Yes. So I think if you're watching it expecting like an American take on a French new wave film. I don't think that's what you're going to get. I think you're just going to get like a small time hustler and they sort of flip around the nationalities, but um, Mm. I still think it's an interesting performance and you get to see gear sort of hashing out who he's going to be on the screen and sort of how he's going to interpret dialogue and character. So it's, it's a fun choice. Uh, I think it's a fun double feature. You can check it out on prime. You can check it out on hoopla. It sounds like something I want to watch other because if it's not going to be like, you know, you know, I jiggle low. I think it's a great double feature. I think it's a, I think it's a great double feature with, with American jiggle. Yeah. No. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. All right. My recommendation shelf. uh, Let's see here. Well, let me just say this. My my overall thoughts. I want to, I want to share this first Uh, on Richard Gere 
is that I think he is overall an underappreciated actor in general. Yeah. He's yeah. had a, you know, a very mm-hmm. interesting career path. Agree. He's never taken, first of all, he's never really taken a backseat to anyone in his films. He, he's even That's in the later part point. of his career, at the minimum, he's either had top billing or he's been co-billed. I think of him actually, you know, as a relic from a bygone era of Hollywood uh, mm-hmm. of the leading men when I think of the likes of like Clark Gable or Cary Grant or Humphrey yeah. Bogart, because, you know, they were considered like the king of cool. And I compare Richard Gere to these types of actors, not necessarily in terms of box office or always, you know, the success of their films, but he's always reminding me kind of like with their demeanor. Mm-hmm. Um, the Classically good looking, yeah. a little naughty, very elegant, and, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, yeah. And timeless. Yeah. Absolutely. These actors, you know, were huge stars and will ever be forever. They'll always be forever mentioned, you know, as icons of cinema, but I wouldn't say they had the greatest range as performers. And I think it's something that is the same for Richard Gere. He's got his lane and he definitely mm-hmm. had his lane uh, for a time in the late seventies through the early eighties as a sex symbol. And he amazingly transformed himself after a dismal seven year run up until <sighs> the night, early 1990s, you know, when he became like a rom-com leading man and actually kind of like an action star. <laughs> when you think about it and looking back at his career, I wish he was given more opportunities from our tour directors, like maybe a Quentin Tarantino or David Fincher or P.T. Anderson, mm. or even like David Lynch to see. Oh, how he'd be could. so good in a oh. Paul Thomas Anderson. Yeah. Sorry. It's Although it's, I do love him in Days of Heaven, you yeah. know? Malik. And, and I just see how he would collaborate with them. I mean, Oliver Stone. How did Richard Gere <sighs> never work with Oliver Stone? I, I just don't know how that never happened. But the movie that I am picking is Internal Affairs, directed by Mike Figgis, which came out uh, in 1990. And I'm picking this for a couple of reasons. First of all, I, I think this film film truly marks the beginning of the second renaissance for Richard Gere's comeback uh, after a disastrous period between 1984 and 1989 when he was in a series of critical and commercial flops. It came out in January of 1990, just two months prior to Pretty Woman, which uh, came out in March. That you know that film obviously took over the world, put Julia Roberts on the map, and once again made Gear uh, a bankable leading man. Internal Affairs also stars Andy Garcia, Nancy Travis, Laurie Metcalf, and it's one of Billy Baldwin's very first performances. So this is a crime thriller. Uh, revolving around police corruption and the centers on the two leading performances from Richard Gere and Andy Garcia, who I think are really wonderful in this. Garcia is this young, idealistic internal affairs officer assigned to investigate police corruption in the department, which leads him to Gere, who's this highly decorated police officer. Gere is absolutely Machiavellian in this film. Uh, Not only is this an extremely underrated Richard Gere performance, I also think it's the most, one of the most underrated movie, he's one of the most underrated movie villains of all time. Uh, To use the term unscrupulous, I think is an understatement. I only wish Gere took on more opportunities throughout his career to play characters like this. He's, he's always kind of, I think of him as the, either the romantic lead or usually the morally righteous hero. And this is such a great turn for him to play such an evil person. I've never seen him do a role unless I have not seen every movie in his catalog, but I can't think of another movie where he plays a character that is just so morally corrupt and such a, just a a horrible person. And I love this because of that. So this is a, a film that I watched over and over and over again, in the nineties and it's one of my favorites and I think it still holds up. I, I mean, I, I rewatched it again recently and I think it's just as good as it was when I was seeing it many times in the nineties. So this is a uh, internal affairs and it, right now it's streaming on prime video and paramount plus and it's on VOD. I do yeah. love it. Eternal affairs. I yeah. really liked it when I watched that. Shout out again to Arbitrage, because though he's not evil in it, he's way, he's not, he's corrupt. He's towards mm. that direction. So yeah. I love well, this and I haven't seen any of your recommendations. So this is really, this is fun. 
Oh yeah, and this makes that. me want to see arbitrage even more now. Yeah. I, I want to see arbitrage. I also, do you guys have you ever seen Unfaithful? I love that movie. Oh, Unfaithful's my good, God, mm. right? Yeah. I, I was just, dude, I it was, was that movie that made my grandmother recite the most harrowing line I've ever heard her say. She looked at me dead in the face and said. Wouldn't mind having Richard Gere's boots under my bed, and that's when I learned my grandmother was a woman. So, <laughs> by the way, guys, you know there's the scene where they stand in the lineup in yeah. uh, Gigolo. They do so much standing in this movie, and I in and the Gigolo that scene where they're like they're, they're like um standing there. It kind of reminded me of the. The what are the the suspects something movie? Oh, Usual Suspects. The Usual mm-hmm. Suspects. Yeah. It kind yeah. of reminded me of that movie. I wonder if that that they took that scene from the Gigolo to do the Usual Suspects. Possibly, yeah. <laughs> Might have, yeah. <laughs> All right, let's move on to our last segment of the show, Movie Musings, where we each share what we've been watching or what we want to watch. That's coming up. So let's begin. Who? Well, I'm not going to say who. Let's start with Sam. Hey, <laughs> hey, everybody. So I will uh, mention a movie that I that I want to watch, and if this is not a usual choice for me because this is a sequel to a movie that, by all accounts, I should not have loved as much as I did because it commits a bunch of CGI sins. It's like overloaded with special effects. It's stuffed. It's like montage-esque in its pacing, but I actually, for some reason, love this movie. I'm referring to 2018's Aquaman. Um, I ha- There's a lot of Marvel movies that I've enjoyed. This is a DC movie, and this is the one DC movie that I really like that's very like lighthearted and action-packed and just a lot of fun. It's one of those weird things where I saw it in the theater and I thought it was okay. I like it more and more. I'm excited for Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom coming it's out. It's James 23rd. Wan magic, baby. It's James Wan, yeah. exactly. I love James Wan, and like he he just made it so much fun. And I'm just I really like the first one, so I'm nervous. I'm hoping that lightning strikes twice because the movie is mm. like sublimely ridiculous. And <laughs> I saw the trailer for the second one, and you can't tell with a modern trailer because like it's it just it looks fine but it's kind of like trailers these days are somewhat impenetrable not in a bad way just in a kind of marketing way so i hope it's good i'm looking forward to it uh don't know a lot about it except the basic plot i just had so much fun with the first aquaman it just it's it feels like part action epic part goonies part spectacle just drenched in CGI, which usually I don't like, but I just, it was like joyous, overkill, fun craziness. So looking forward to that movie for I sure. That. Great. He waved his magic wand. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. It was fun. <laughs> right. Ellie, are you ready to go next? Yes. So I, I, I've been watching, um, hold on. I've seen, uh, this weekend I saw pain hustlers, which, um, uh, Emily Blunt, which I love. I love her. Mm-hmm. And I love Emily. And uh, our one of my favorites, <laughs> Captain America. Okay, Chris Evans. <sighs> He's so hot. Anyway, <laughs> I worked with him before on set. Yes. And I got to see him like this close and we got to talk anyway. But um, <laughs> oh, he's the sweetest man ever. Very kind. Uh, okay, so I watched the pain- podcast. Pain Hustlers, 2023 on Netflix by David Yates, I guess. Uh, it is about the pharmaceutical. He did something besides Harry Potter? <laughs> <laughs> oh, he wow. He did. He directed uh, some Fantastic Beast movies as well. It's like, hey, Paul <laughs> Harry. The guy has yeah. done like seven like Harry Potter franchise films in a row, I think. But that's impressive. All right. There you go. Um, it's actually a really good movie. And it's based on this, you know, the pharmaceuticals and the um, the selling of opi- opioids and, you know, and, mm-hmm. and how um, a really it's, it's a, I think it was, you know, a great film, but it's a good film for Netflix. And I love the actors and I love what it stands for, which is about, you know, the morality of the pharmaceuticals, that they don't have any morals. They just sell you drugs. And we as humans are 
and slaves to med- medical uh, drugs anyway. So watch it. Uh, then I watched no, no Hard Feelings 2023 with um, Jennifer Lawrence, another one of my favorites. I thoroughly enjoyed that film. <laughs> I love, oh, there was nothing wrong with that movie. Every part of that movie I enjoyed thoroughly. Everything. I especially loved the nude scene with Jennifer Lawrence where she does Kung Fu. <laughs> It's just like what? <laughs> when she you have given me a million years to guess how your sentence would end, and I wouldn't have gotten it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, there's a great, you know, not, not to spoil too much, but there's a. If anyone has not seen it here on the podcast or in the audience, there's just an amazing scene with her coming on the beach, just yeah. kicking kicking ass. Um, completely naked, and it's uh, it's so <laughs> unexpected. I don't want to spoil too much on it, but Ellie, no. go, go ahead. It is it yeah. is amazing. And and you know, <laughs> uh, the thing is, <laughs> Jennifer Lawrence is such a oh, I, I love her because but she I, don't do she don't scene. care about anything. No. She is who she no. is, and she's not apologetic about who she is. And I love that about her because I can't be the same way. I I don't have to apologize to anybody about who I am. It is. You take me as I am or you don't. I don't really care. And she's the same way, you know, and I love it. You know, the fact that she's interviewed by, a, 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 you know, after the Oscars, she says, what are you wearing? She goes, what am I wearing? A dress. What are you, what are you asking me for? Like, that's something that I would answer anyway as well. So I was like, yeah, that's my girl. Anyway, <laughs> I also watch Bodies, a limited series on Netflix. Dude. Whoa. Have you seen that series yet? I'm hearing Mm-mm. a lot of buzz. I'm hearing a lot of bu- good oh, buzz. Okay, it's throwing me for a loop, and I'm st- I haven't finished it yet. But I'm it. Yeah, I, I don't know what to make of it yet. I don't know what's going on. I really don't know what's going on. It, but it's very um, what do you call it? Quantum uh, mechanic. I used to go with quantum mm. mania. <laughs> <laughs> And I love anything quantum <laughs> mechanics. So, um, uh, and I just, I don't know. I can't tell you. It's just very intriguing, mysterious, scientific. And it, it takes, um, it's about three different, um, what do you call it? Seasons, decades. It's, mm-hmm. it's based in 1890, 1941, and then 2023, and then the oh, cool. 2053. So, I don't know what it's about. I'm still in the mysterious part. I haven't yet figured it out. What platform is Bodies on? Netflix. Netflix. Okay. All right. Yep. Thank awesome. you, Ellie. Um, yeah. uh, B, what have you been watching? Uh, well, I know our, our listeners are going to be hearing us in the future, but I'm coming at you from the past where it's not quite <laughs> Halloween. So I've been doing my spooky stuff. Um, I watched, I was really excited. I hadn't seen this yet. I finally got to tuck into Abel Ferrara's The Addiction, uh, which I just thought was really fantastic. 1995, it's on the Criterion channel. Abel's the king of cool. You know, I think if you like Jim Jarmusch, if you like No Wave, if you like black and white movies in New York, this is a good one and you should check it out. Uh, I thought it was, I can see how it would be polarizing. I think it could easily come across as pretentious, but I thought it was really well executed. I thought it moved. It has brilliant casting. Edie Falco is in it. Christopher Walken is in it. Check it out. I. It's just a great vampire movie and very open about it being an analogy for addiction and um, Ferrara's own journey with that. So I thought it was great. And then um, later on in the week, I did a little Jalo double feature with Mario Bava's Blood and Black Lace. And mm. then I moved into Argento Suspiria, um, two total classics. I think they're indelible to the genre. Um, for listeners who don't know, Jalo, the Italian horror genre, sort of the precursor to the more, more vulgar American slasher film um but really great at at making style a substance and talking uh through the visual language of light and color and shadows in a really fun kaleidoscope of horror um suspiria man it's just you know argento didn't invent the genre but he really perfected it just peak of his craft right time in history freaky as heck could watch it all day so good all right 
Okay, um, so I had a busy, somehow I managed to watch a decent amount of things, but I'm going to try to be brief about it. First thing I watched, I actually watched this movie twice this week and it didn't mean to, but I watched this on my own and then I ended up watching this with my family after the fact. And this oh, is, shoot. you are so not invited to my bat mitzvah. I from, heard this was good. From director Sammy Cohen. This is the newest film from Happy Madison Productions, Adam Sandler's company. And uh, this stars the entire Adam Sandler family, Sonny Sandler, Sadie Sandler, Jackie Sandler, and of course, Adam Sandler. Also stars uh, Adina Menzel, Luis Guzman, and Samantha Lorraine. Now, um, I used to enjoy... Adam Sandler's early films, probably up through Big Daddy was the last one that mm-hmm. I really enjoyed. Then they got really stupid and I have not mm-hmm. really kept up with them. But even though this is a happy Madison joint, this is technically in a technically a comedy. It is not a traditional Adam Sandler comedy. This, this one really does have a heart and a message to it. It's about a, a daughter of this family who's preparing for her bat mitzvah and she's 13 and in the seventh grade and is going through all the drama that a 13 year old girl goes through boys, social media, social media mishaps, angst with friends and frenemies. And of course all the tension with her family and it's got, you know, all these feelings and all th- it feels very authentic. Um, as you know, I have a daughter that's exactly the same age as this girl, pretty much she's 12 and she's also preparing for her bat mitzvah. So, you know, I hear I am witnessing firsthand under my own roof. A lot of the things happening in this movie <laughs> and it felt very close to home, at least for, and at least from a parent perspective. So for parents out there with daughters at this age, it's the perfect Halloween movie because it was freaking terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I watched this and I came out and I, and I, and I told the rest of the family, I think I have a movie that we should all watch together. It scared <laughs> the hell out of me, but yeah. And Adam Sandler, if, if he deters you, don't worry. It is not a, a slapsticky movie. It really is, um, uh, a, a, a decent movie. So anyways, that is uh, what I watched a couple times this week. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also want, you know, since we watched American Gigolo, I decided, you know what? I want to catch up with the latest from Paul Schrader. So I watched his, the most recent one, Master Gardener, which came out a year ago. Mm-hmm. This um, it seemed like a perfect way of, uh, and I have, if, is anyone else familiar with this film or his trilogy of the, the Man in the Room trilogy that he did? which includes First Reform from 2017 or 2021's The Card Counter. The Card Counter. Yeah. I love both of those movies. I thought First Reform was a masterpiece. Yes. I actually like both those. I actually like The Card Counter a little bit more, but they're both phenomenal. Anyway. I need to see it again. Yeah. yeah. So I think Master Gardner is by far the weakest of the three for me. It stars Mm -hmm. Joel Edgerton, who I typically like in movies, but I think in this film, the casting didn't work for me. Uh, Also has Sigourney Weaver and Quintessa Swindell, I think is how you say it. In a nutshell, Joel Edgerton is a gardener working in an estate run by Sigourney Weaver. Weaver's niece comes to the estate to join the workforce, but her mom died because her mom died and Edgerton is asked to take care of her and take her under a wing and show her the ropes of gardening. We learn about his dark past, which creates this interesting dynamic. And as to why he he takes a liking to this niece, you know, it's, it's, it's a very, very odd movie, which shouldn't surprise you, but it didn't really work for me. Overall, I thought this film was just really strange and I found it very unsatisfying, but I, Mm -hmm. I, it's a bummer. Yeah. I didn't compared. If you compare this to first reformed in the card counter, I think it's, it's inferior. So that's, that's that. Well, the hard to live up to the hype of those two. Yeah. I did catch up on killers of the flower moon and I'm not going to give much of a review because you guys said everything about it last week, and I echo everything you said. This movie absolutely gutted me to the bone. I think it may be uh, Martin Scorsese's greatest film since Goodfellas. I, pr- I think it 
absolutely is his best film since Goodfellas and maybe his second or third best of all time. I love that yeah. movie. So all I'm going to say about it. And um, one other thing I watched was um, because as you already mentioned, it is, even though this is coming out in November, it is just before Halloween. I watched Angel Guts High School co-ed um this is um this is a series of a first movie of a series of films from uh this is uh what's the director of this this is uh chizzy chizu son who was kind of it's like a he's like a japanese exploitation director he's Mm -hmm. been around for decades and decades i think he passed away uh, 10 years ago or so i forget exactly but i said you know i'm gonna see what these movies are about and i watched the first movie in this series of films and i am it was it was something this movie has some really horrific abuse towards women which made this hard to watch but i will (laughs) say that it really is uh, an art house film and uh, was I love I I love a well crafted low budget grimy filthy bootstraps production when I see one and this one was interesting and I am curious to see the rest of the movies in this series but it, if you have an issue with horrible violence toward women do not watch this movie because it holds nothing back but yeah. The last thing I just want to say, because I cannot wait for this, Silent Night is the new John Woo movie coming out on yes. December 1st. Um, ho- the holidays are around the corner. So I think, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I just wanted to put this on everyone's radar. Uh, it looks like a hell of a lot of fun. The trailer is out everywhere. It's an action thriller. It has no dialogue. It stars Christian McCurry, who many know from the Suicide Squad films. He plays Rick Flagg in those movies. Probably the best part of those films, especially that first one. Um, the mo- that movie was trash, but Christian McCurry was great in it. I'm just psyched because John Woo is returning to Hollywood. It's his first American feature mm-hmm. since 2003's Paycheck. It looks like it's going to be a bloody good time, and I can't <laughs> wait to see it in the theater. It's coming out December 1st. So there's my exposition dump of everything that I've been watching or can't wait to see. There you have it. <laughs> so any other final thoughts before we wrap it up? No. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Sam, I see you're still trying to test your eyes there. You're fine. Don't yeah, worry about it. Yes. You're just getting old. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Well, this was fun. I, I, I need water because I've been just talking for like eight minutes straight here. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, that concludes our show for this week. We sincerely appreciate your listenership this week. As a final reminder, if you're enjoying what you hear, please consider leaving a rating and review. Your support truly brightens our day. The ideal platforms for this are Apple Podcasts or iTunes or whichever platform you use to access our content. To stay updated, don't forget to subscribe to our monthly newsletter, Frame Rate Monthly, by sending an email to backtotheframerate at gmail.com. Back to the Frame Rate is a proud member of the Western Media Podcast Network. Stay connected with us on Facebook and Instagram and threads. You can find that at Back to the Frame Rate. And of course, the most effective way to support us is by sharing our episodes on your social media platforms. That's it. The show is over. (coughs) Goodbye. I want you to know it's over.